Hello and Happy New Year. My name is Atuba George and this is the first broadcast I'm doing for this year. And those of you that are used to uh, our daily messages, you would notice that since this year began, we've not been bringing forth God's word like we do. Now that's because the Lord instructed me last December and he said to me, I want you to be very quiet as you enter the year. Because the Lord said, there are things that will begin to happen and I don't want you to say anything. Don't even pray consigning it. That was instruction I received from the Lord. And he said, don't say anything and don't pray. He said, act as Jesus acted even towards John the Baptist. Now, if you understand what happened, you would, uh, between Jesus and John the Baptist, when John the Baptist was in prison. Uh, so I received that instruction from the Lord and that's why we didn't do any message this month so far. But then the Lord, having waited for the next instruction, the Lord instructed me to release this broadcast. And I asked the Lord if I can release it today, which is a, a special day, it's my birthday. And I, I, the Lord gave me permission to do so. Now I'm going to be sharing some very important thoughts with us. And this is very important for you because it has to do with the church and the body of Christ. I'm going to speak according to the things the Lord have shared with me and taught me. And I'm going to be speaking by the wisdom by which the Lord have instructed and taught me over the years. But the message is for now, because I heard the Lord command me to give this message now. Now, if you've been born again for a very long time, and if you're someone who thinks, not just following the move, you know, whatever happens, whatever excitement, sometimes you pull yourself back and you want to watch and see okay what's going on what's different now than before you would notice something and even if you've not been born again for so long maybe you read a lot if you especially if you study about revivals and the happenings of the church before now you would have noticed something and and and, and i pray you take time to listen to what i'm about to share with you and also, I will encourage you to help me share this message too, so it gets to as many people as it would get to. And that's a good thing about today. We can save up things on social media. So it's there. Someone is going to hear this message and run with it. Praise God. So if you've been born again for a very long time, you would have or you, you, you're a good reader, you study events, you would notice that uh, there seems to be this thing that happens with the church. Revivals happen. They get to full bloom. And then there's a calmness. And then another revival starts again. It gets to its full bloom. And then there is a calmness. Ecclesiastes even said it, that there is nothing that is happening that has not happened before. But what my concern, and those are things that stirred my heart, and I began to pray concerning it, and before the Lord began to reveal some things and teach me some things. Have you ever wondered what God is up to with us? Have you ever wondered you know, you know, human beings will say, you're born, you grow, you 
become a man or a woman, you get married, give back to other children, take care of them, they grow, and then you die, they continue, and then life keeps going like that. What's the essence of this whole thing? Same way you get born again, you hear different things, you know. Some says, oh, um, prayer, it's prayer. We must, we must pray when, when, you know. So there's a prayer movement. Oh, the word, the word, the word. So there's a word movement. Oh, miracles, miracles, miracles. So there's this revival of miracles, different kinds of things. And sometimes you, like I said, if you've been a long, you've been a long time in this, you look back and look at the people that used to be on fire many, many years ago. And you look at their lives today, not so many have maintained their fire. Some have fallen out of the way. Some are still born again, but they seem to act wiser than they used to be. Now, when I say wiser, not in God's truth, or not according to God, in human wisdom. So sometimes it looks as though they regret about their actions or the way they went about their Christianity many years ago when they were much younger. Now, now, truly speaking, when you speak to many people, they fall short of saying, um, I regret a lot of things. Not regret being born again, not regret being saved. But maybe I should have spent my time doing other things other than, you know, dipping things in God's word and in church work. You find a lot of people like that. The only ones that are still maybe excited, most of it, are those who kind of are benefiting from maybe those who went on to become church pastors and they are doing well, their churches are doing well. So now naturally, when you say your church is doing well, of course it means financially you're okay. See that? Now it boils down to one very important thing. Now, this is where it gets very important. Those who have remained and consistent, there is a kind of comfort physically that they enjoy, okay? And those who fell away, now not completely falling away, I'm not talking about those who backslid it. I'm talking about those who became um, calm, no more pushing. What made them calm? They seemed to go away to look for um, how to take care of themselves. So you find people who are on fire for the Lord. And same thing, you know, if you've gone to school, you, you, when you're on campus, for example, you see lots of people, brethren, they were on fire. Like, look, heaven is the only thing that's our concern, okay? But then they leave school. Where is this one? Ah, he's, he's, where is this one? He's at so and so. So what happened to all that fire? It boils down to one thing. They went to look for how to take care of themselves. Now, there are many people who want to share their thoughts on these things. But I'm just going to tell you the mind of God as he has revealed it to me. Now, if you have a contrary view from the Lord, not just your thinking. You see, if I share something, I say, oh, I don't agree with that. What is your agreement, disagreement based on? Your thinking or God have told you something that counters what I'm saying. I'll be more concerned about things God have told you because I'm coming from the place of fellowshipping with the Lord. And the things I share with you, I know God taught me. And not just, he didn't just teach me yesterday. It's been line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little and there a little. So you find out that the bottom line of all these things is one thing. And what's that? The desire to be comfortable in life. 
the desire to be comfortable in life. When people notice that it seems they are not getting it with this mentality they have about God, they seem to step down a bit so they go get it somewhere else. There are people who, would have, who you would have sworn this one would never go look for a job, secular job. You know what I mean by that? Not that I'm saying it's wrong, but I'm saying there were people who you thought from where they were going, what they were, the projection of their lives, you would think, oh, these ones are ministry materials. Young people then. But the years have passed. You see them here, you see them there, you see them here. But what are they looking for? I'm not saying they are sinning. I'm driving at something very important. So I began to look at this whole thing. I began to study this whole thing. Even the revivals that have taken place, you'll find a pattern. And what's the pattern? The Spirit of God is poured out and a lot of activities are going on. Different kinds of revivals taking place. And then it gets to its climax. And then the next thing that happens is strife comes in from the main actors, I mean, in between the main actors. Strife come in, then there is division, and it, it produces denominations, okay? And those denominations, de denominations exist until the next revival comes. And the next revival comes from a different angle. And then it continues, gets to its climax, and then strife comes in. It's been a pattern. If you've not noticed this good study about revivals, it's been a pattern. So I began to ask the Lord, I said, Lord, this looks like a useless venture. And that's how I talk to the Lord, so mind my speaking this way. I said, this looks like a useless venture. I don't think I want to be involved with this. What are you driving at? What is God concerned about when it comes to we here on earth? When it comes to the work of the ministry? When it comes to serving God? What is God all about? Is it about going to heaven? How many, how long have we expected that one day we'll go to heaven? And, and we receive revelation from God's word. And every generation, they just think this is the last generation. But then, it's been years, and over 100 years, 200 years, we're still in the same place in terms of expectation. Now, when you begin to study God's Word, like I said, by the help of the Holy Spirit, because these things, no man can just wake up and be able to factor these things in. When you begin to study God's word, and then I began to realize that, hey, God called Abraham. Christianity or the church as we have it today, you cannot bypass Abraham no matter what part of the world you come from there is something that drives us to Abraham okay yeah so God called Abraham and made a promise to him and in the promise God made to Abraham God said something very important he said in your seed all the families of the earth will be blessed now we've read that scripture many times but see sitting down to understand and meditate until the spirit of god begins to bring its meaning to your heart in your seed all the families of the earth will be blessed now, the word blessed actually means taking care of. Taking care of. 
So when God was talking to Abraham, he says, look, all the families of the earth will be taken care of. Now, God made this promise to Abraham. I mean, this, this was a promise he made when he called Abraham. And you find God repeating this same promise in Isaac and then in Jacob. Today, we, are, we belong to Christ. And the Bible lets us know that if you are Christ, you are Abraham's seed. But the promise still stands. The promise God made to Abraham. The promise is that all the families of the earth will be taken care of. And God who does not forget his promise. So amazingly, when you study the scriptures, God told Abraham, your children will be in a foreign land and they will be there for 400 years. They will be tormented for 400 years. And after 400 years, I will bring them out and they will come out with great substance. God said that to Abraham. Many years, more than 400 years later, he's speaking to Moses and he says, go to Egypt. I have heard their cry. I'm going to bring them out. And when they come out, they will come out with great substance. So God did not forget word for word the promise he made to Abraham. And God did what he said. The Bible said when it was time for them to come out of Egypt, God commanded them to go borrow stuff from the Egyptians. Okay? And they went and they got stuff from the Egyptians. And indeed, just like God said to Abraham, they came out of Egypt with great substance. Okay. Same way when God spoke to Abraham, says, in you, I'm going to bless all the families of the earth. Now that's to give you the mindset of God that he was talking to one man in Mesopotamia, right? And then he's saying to this man, through you, I'm going to bless all the families of the earth. Think about it. What was God thinking? Why can't he just say, I'm going to bless all the family of, families of the earth? Why did he have to say, through you, your seed, I will bless all the families of the earth? Now that's a prophecy. Every child of God is supposed to be a good student of prophecy. What do I mean being a good student of prophecy? Find out what God has said. Find out the blessings and the promises he's made to you. And look at your life and ask yourself, where am I in this prophecy? So where are we in this prophecy that God gave to Abraham? Where are we? He says all the families of the earth, not all the families of Israel. He said all the families of the earth will be blessed by the seed of Abraham. So where are we because i'll tell you something no matter how we wait for the promise of the return of jesus every prophecy now that's what god is working at god is working at every word he has spoken being fulfilled so rather than waiting for jesus to return let's keep our eyes on the fulfillment of every prophecy at least as much as we have access to by knowledge, trusting the help of the Holy Spirit. So this is one important prophecy that concerns the whole world. Where are we in it? Sometimes the Spirit of God falls on us and we begin to walk in a particular dimension and we think this is the dimension everybody should walk in. But you find out that no, that's not how God thinks. Number two, whatever dimension you walk in as a child of God is by grace. It has nothing to do with anything you have done. Trust me, praise God, trust me. Whatever dimension of grace you walk in, I said, it is by grace. It has nothing to do with anything you have done. 
if it has any, if it has something to do with anything you have done, then it's C, who will be able to replicate that thing over and over and over and over and over. But like I always say this, Philip in scriptures, he was commanded to join himself to the chariot of the Ethiopian eunuch. He met the guy, preached to him, guy received the gospel, saw water, got baptized. And the Bible said the spirit of God took away Philip, right? He disappeared. And the next thing he was found in another city. So the Holy Ghost took him and he landed in another city. So Philip disappeared. Now this same Philip that disappeared was preaching in Samaria and the whole city turned over to the Lord. Philip that disappeared couldn't get one person filled with the Holy Ghost. Now when, when you hear that this man disappeared, like, wow, God, I want to walk in that dimension. But this same Philip couldn't get, go read your Bible. Acts chapter 8, it says, as at that time, Acts chapter 8 into chapter 9, as at that time, no one in Samaria had received the Holy Ghost. So Philip had to send to Jerusalem and they sent Peter and John to come and they began to lay hands on the people to receive the Holy Ghost. Then they began to speak in other tongues. The whole city responded to Philip, but Philip didn't get anyone filled with the Holy Ghost. That's something to ponder on. I'll give you another thought. Elijah went before the Lord and he was complaining. He said, hey Lord, I'm tired. Look, everybody has gone away from you. Everybody's doing their own thing. I'm the only one that is standing true. Now he said that because he was sure of what he was talking about. He had not come across anyone else walking by faith. He had not come across anyone who's made up his mind that, look, I'm going to stick with God, man. So he told God, I'm, I'm the only one. And God said to him, hey, you're not the only one. I have 7,000, not 700. I have 7,000 men who have not bowed down their knees to bow. 7,000 men. Hey, hold on. Elijah did not stumble into a cave and found them. No, he was having an interaction with God. And God was the one that informed him and said, I have. Notice, he didn't say there are. God says, I have 7,000 men. So God knew these 7,000 men. Elijah did not know a single one of them. Elijah felt he was the greatest prophet in his time. Not just greatest prophet, he thought he was the only one. But God said, hey, I have 7,000. Where were they? You may have whatever theory you want to give. Oh, they, they couldn't stand out. They couldn't, they couldn't. Uh, 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 uh. God did not reprimand them. God did not say, don't mind them. I've been telling them to come out. They didn't come out. Can I tell you something? Could it be that Elijah unknowingly was standing in the faith of those 7,000 men? Could it be their role was just to be in their secret place and be praying for the nation? And by their prayer, Elijah was supposed to ride upon the grace that he was riding on. Could it be their mission or their purpose was never to be known? Could it just be? So, your place in God is secured, irrespective of what other people are doing. It's not everybody that will be out there doing something great. And it doesn't mean those who are doing the great things that men see are the greatest. No, you should know enough to know that that's not true. The greatest people in God's eyes, most likely, you don't see them. You don't see them. But in their secret place, they are holding the earth. Are you getting what I'm saying? They are holding the earth. 
So all these activities that we are involving, ministers, Christians, all these activities, mostly it's even begin to influence most preachers and causing them to begin to teach things according to the world. Now that's a very sad place to be. When you begin to look at the world and use the standard of the world or the activities of the world to judge your message or your gospel. For example, thank you Lord Jesus. You hear preachers say, upon all our tithing and offering and prayer, the, most, the, the richest people in the world are not Christians. You know what I mean, are not Christians. They are not born again believers. Why? So people look at that and begin to say, all these teachings about blessing and prosperity is a fraud. Now that's the biggest error you find amongst preachers. Comparing themselves with unbelievers. That, you know, they, their thinking is that if we're doing it right, then we should have been the richest in the world. No, sir. No. No. That's not how God designed it. Go read the Bible. Study. If God is concerned about the richest, being the richest in the world, then I think Jesus would have been the richest man that ever lived physically. It would have been on record that Jesus was so rich that, I mean, when, when they checked, he was the richest man in the world. But no. His birth was something you want to just wish away. His lifestyle. Isaiah said, there was no beauty in him that we should desire him. Yet, he was the richest. They say we judge like that because we are covetous in our hearts. So when we say the richest, guess what we begin to think? How many cars, how many houses, how many lands, how much cash does he have to his name? That's covetousness. So when we say, how come Christians are not the richest in the world? The person saying that is covetous in his thinking because he thinks by what a man possesses, the man is made, but that's wrong. God proved it in the life of Job. In a moment, everything came crashing. Yet, Job didn't lose his balance with God. He still maintained his place with God. So I began to ask the Lord, I said, Lord, how do we really fulfill your will? What exactly do you want? And the Lord began to minister this to me. Two very important things we should be concerned about as God's children. Number one, developing a culture of godliness. I'm going to explain that. I said developing a culture of godliness. Now, when I say developing a culture of godliness, I'm not saying you as an individual develop a culture. No. Bringing forth a system in the earth, in the world, that will produce a culture of godliness. So I'm going to explain. Number two, pushing and providing for laws that will uphold the culture of godliness. See these two important things. Number one, developing a culture of godliness. Number two, pushing for laws. When I mean laws, laws, state laws, okay? Federal laws that will uphold the culture of godliness. So when I say pushing for the culture of godliness, what am I referring to? So when we say godliness, what is godliness? 
living a holy life. What do you call a holy life? We go back to what God said to Abraham. Because if anything you do is not in line with the fulfillment of God's agenda, it's useless. It's useless. So what is the culture of godliness? God says he wants to bless all the families of the earth. Now where we are today, God has set up every machinery to achieve that. The last thing that God is waiting for is the people to align. When I say the people, God's children to align. Many years ago, the Lord began to show me a principle he set in scripture. And, and in recent years, the Lord began to connect that dot and said, this is it. And what's that? And I'm going to share with you. The man God made the promise to, Abraham, God taught him something very important, and that is tithing. I'll tell you this today, that when God said to Abraham that through him, all the families of the earth will be blessed, the way he's going to achieve that is through tithing. Tithe, yes. So I say, ah, he wants to talk about that. I'm tuning off. Just be patient for a moment and listen. So God taught Abraham concerning the tithes. And he says, you must bring the tithe. And Abraham obeyed God when he met Melchizedek and he gave him the tithe. Now, people have brought all kinds of suggestions. Oh, who was Melchizedek? Melchizedek was the king. Melchizedek was not, um, hey, follow scriptures. There are things we don't argue about when we can just follow scriptures. If Melchizedek was a man, then who did Isaac, who did Jacob pay tithes to? Remember, Jacob vowed to give God his tithe. So, if it was men that used to receive the tithe, as people think that Melchizedek was a man, how come Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, haven't been instructed by Abraham? Now vow to God and say, I will give you. Think about it. So the tithe from the very beginning belonged to God. God commanded Abraham concerning the tithe. It was God that taught Abraham how to tithe to him. And so you find in, in the law, Moses giving them the law concerning tithing, and he, he gave them different instructions concerning how to give the tithe. One of it, he said, you and your family will take it and go to the place where the Lord will put his name and you will all sit down there and eat like a feast. What are you feasting on? The tithes. Another instruction God gave concerning the tithe, he said the Levites will come take the tithe. Okay? Another instruction God gave, he said every three years must be the year of tithing. That's the, the Jewish people now. And on, on that third year, they won't tithe the way they tithe every other year. On that third year, they will gather the whole of their tithe from the beginning of the year to the end of the year. And at the end of the year, they will bring all their tithes to the gates. And when they bring it to the gates, these set of people will come take as much as they want. The Levites, the fatherless, the widows, the strangers. Take note of these instructions. Uh, God gave Moses these instructions for the children of Israel. Where is he driving at? Remember, he made Abraham a promise. Through you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And now we know in Christ Jesus, we have all come to become the seed of Abraham. The promise still exists. Through you, 
and your seed, all the families of the earth will be blessed. So God from Abraham began to lay claim to 10% of everything you get. And what do you think he was going to use that for? Remember, he said in Jeremiah, he says, for I know the thoughts that I think towards you, they are thoughts of good and not evil. I love the Amplified Translation. He said, they are thoughts and plans. And he went for that, they plans for your welfare and peace. So when God says, I have plans for you, it is plans for your welfare. Okay. So today as God's children, understanding that the tithe belongs to the Lord. It doesn't belong to any church. It belongs to the Lord. The tithe is God's money. And if it's God's money, we as God's children must be conscious to bring his money to him. And how do we bring his money to him? We believe God speaks. We believe God is alive. Right? If he is alive, why don't we consult him with, I mean, to know what he wants us to do with his money? Why is it important we consult him? Because there was a promise that all the families of the earth will be blessed, will be taken care of, will be, will be fed, will, their welfare will be arranged. From day one, God had a special concern. What's that concern? To meet the need of everyone. Every supernatural thing you face, every prayer, every miracle boils down to this one thing. That's what I told you at the beginning. The same reason many have left the faith, the same reason many have toned down. So when Jesus came and he began to teach, he said, take no thought for your life, saying, what will I eat? Or clothes, what will I put on? What was this, what, why was this saying? I said, because your father takes thoughts concerning those things. He knows that you need it. So he says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Now, I said, that's the end point. The end point in all these things being given to you. The same reason you will not seek God, you'll be seeking those things. Jesus is saying, uh-uh. You see those things? God is thinking about them for you. We will get to the point of every revival. If, we, if you want to know, okay, what does God really want? This is what God wants. All the families of the earth being blessed, not by NGOs, but through the seed of Abraham and there's a reason for that now this is what is going to continue forever and ever and ever and I heard the Lord say to me say tell my children if they are not focused on this then they are not focused on my kingdom what is the kingdom go out preach to people get them saved bring them to our church our church increases and then what next what next? The message he is giving to us is that all the families of the earth will be blessed. And how is that going to take place? Through the seed of Abraham. Now you are the seed of Abraham. How active are you involved in bringing to pass this prophecy that God said to Abraham concerning you. So here is it then. I'm blessed, right? With some money. 
Is it money? Why? It boils down to money. I'll tell you the truth. It boils down to money. So everything God is talking about boils down. Now, you may not agree with me today, but you will get to find out. It boils down to your needs being met. The greatest distraction in life is right there, trying to get your needs met. Most times men have sinned, men have disobeyed God for this same reason, getting your needs met. Study the book of Joel, the prophecies of Joel in chapter 2. God was conscious to first of all satisfy the people in the prophecy. He said, they will be so blessed that my people shall never be ashamed. Then after that, I'll pour out my spirit upon all flesh. If the world doesn't get to the point where it knows by experience that God is taking care of everyone. I said, if the world, God had declared as I leave, every knee shall bow to me, right? How is that going to be achieved? You think it's by holding crusades and by displaying power. They will be excited. They will be amazed. But that's just far how far it goes. God is bigger than that. This is the thinking of God. You are blessed. You receive some money. And then you go before the Lord and say, Lord, you've blessed me here is your tithe what do i do with it and the lord says now it is money remember the lord says take it to so so and so take it to two blocks from you and give it over to that person give it to your colleague at work give it to that pastor over there give it to that church over there now when all of god's children begin to function with god in this light what's going to be happening in the world the lord asks me to give you this really yeah the lord asks me to give you this sorry how yeah the lord asks me to give you this now this is what is going to be going and happening all over the world by the seed of Abraham. Why the seed of Abraham? Because they are the ones that have access to the voice of God. It's not about giving things out. I want you to understand because sometimes we miss it. It's about how those things are being given out. You can gather things and give out to people and they'll be excited but that's where it ends. But there is something about you being in your house, trusting God for money or for whatever it is, and someone knocking on your door, someone you never spoke to, someone you never discussed with, knocking on your door and saying, hey, I was praying two days ago and the Lord asked me to come bring this to you. Are you serious? Yeah. The Lord asked me to bring this to you. Now imagine this taking place all over the world. Imagine every believer being involved with this. You know what we're doing? He says all the families of the earth will be blessed. Now, we are not just giving money. We are not just giving provisions. We are bringing the blessing to them. What is the blessing? That God knew you and sent me to you. We're not faking it. Why the tithe? Hey, but, but why can't God tell me to use every other money? God is wiser than you. Your money is your money. His money is his money. He has determined that with his money, he wants to bless all the families of the earth. 
So he said 10% of what is in your hand belongs to God. And let me tell you this truth. If the church, when I mean the church, God's children will just be faithful with that little 10%, there will be no hunger in the world. So but 10% is small. Oh, wait until God's children arise with their 10%. Then you will understand that God will get rid of all covetousness. Oh, you don't know? Yeah. Then you realize that everybody has, nobody lacks. I said two things, culture and laws to back the culture. So the Lord was saying to me, the church needs to begin to reorganize their thinking and bring it in line with this truth. If you, if you don't accept this today, one day, see, God is walking because the fact that he told me doesn't mean I'm the only one he told or he's talking to. He's doing a work. You may not see it. He's doing a work. But you see, the work gets faster when we yield early. That's why I'm sharing this truth with you. Your tithe belongs to God. And he wants to use it to fulfill the promise he made to Abraham. That is how he planned for the tithe. So here is the point. You get money, you go before him because you're a child of God, you're a seed of Abraham. You go before him, say, Father, you have blessed me. And here is the tithe. And the Lord says, okay, keep it for me. I'll ask you when I need it. And you keep it for him. When he needs it, he comes for it. And when he instructs you concerning it, as you obey him, you're bringing the blessing to that family, to whoever you bring it to. They have the testimony that God blessed them. It is going to reduce the crime rate in the world. Oh, yes. I always give this example. Imagine one who's looking for money. Nobody wakes up except some very few cases where they are children of perdition. Nobody wakes up and just thinks he wants to go and rob. Most times they are driven by lack and the need for something. So they just feel this is the only way out or the easiest way out. Go harm, scare other people and take from them. But the man who's telling himself, I need a thousand dollars. And if I don't get this thousand dollars by Friday, I'll go rob. And here you show up on Thursday, knocking on his door and said, hey, how are you doing? God spoke to me and said, I should come give you this on a thousand dollars. What do you think is going to happen to that person? Most likely, the whole idea of ever going to rob drops that moment. Not only for that event, even for the future, when he gets into the place of need and an evil thought wants to get into his heart, he will remember how God came through the last time. The fear of God will fill his heart. Now, in our little way, as we do these things, I've seen men transform to get into that place where they fear God because of this simple thing. But the church is not doing so today. That's why God spoke in Malachi. He says, you have robbed me, even this whole nation. So when God says, bring ye all the tithe into my storehouse, he's not talking, to one, talking about one physical storehouse. There is no physical storehouse anybody can build and call God's storehouse. No. When we all gather the tithe, that's God's storehouse. It's in your hand. God's storehouse is in your hands. 
So God says, so that they will be meat in my house. Now, the Holy Spirit is the control center. Anyone who's not connected to the Holy Spirit can't function in this. So by this, God is going to establish righteousness on the earth. Yeah. You that is coming forth with the tithe, you are in relationship with God. Okay? God speaks to you. And that's the whole essence. The whole essence of being in Christ, the whole essence of being children of God, is that we will hear the voice of our Father. If you don't hear the voice of God, you're not a Christian. You're not a child of God. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. So don't even argue and say, how many, of, how many Christians hear God? No, how many Christians do we have? A child of God must hear the voice of his father. If not, how do you claim he's your father? When you don't know his voice. No. The sonship is in great doubt. So listen, God's children. When we begin to, as individuals, accept this truth, then we will begin to form the culture that God was talking about. And number two, God, now God is talking about all the families of the earth. And remember, in the book of Revelation, it was declared that the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdom of our God and he shall reign. How is it going to happen? Have you ever thought about it? You take over a kingdom when you're able to affect two things. Affect their culture, affect their laws. So as we begin to partner with God in this reality, this is what God is going to start doing. God is going to start exalting his children into positions of influence and authority. Now, what's the purpose of that? Some of you are Christians. You find yourself in positions of authority and you don't know what to do with it. To the most, now because of wrong teachings, you think in this place of authority, there's good money coming here. So let me take the money and be giving to my church. Let me take the money and be supporting God's work. It looks good, but that's not the purpose of you being there. The purpose of you being there first is to establish God's kingdom in that environment. You are a manager of a place. You are head of a parastatal, government or private. What is your role? What is your job? Establish the kingdom of God in that place. Establish it as a culture. Establish it as a law. So your job and God is depending on you for this. The moment you sit in the organization, your first concern should be how do I make sure that both the poor and the rich are all catered for very well? How do I make sure that from the highest ranking person in that organization to the lowest ranking person, nobody lacks. This is God's mindset. This is all God thinks about. He looks at the world. This is all he's thinking about. He anoints people. This is all he's thinking about. Meeting their needs. Ministry is meeting the needs of the people. No matter how much anointing you carry, you may float on the air. But if people's needs are not met, your ministry is nothing to them. You may sound high, shout. If their needs are not met, your ministry is nothing to them. This is the cry of the heart of Jesus. He wants the needs of people met. So as an individual, begin to give God's money where it ought to go. 
And two, together, let's begin to build a culture. Yeah. When God said to them, you see how God the reasons. When God said to them, every three years, you must gather the tithes and put it at your gates. That's a culture God was building. That's a culture God was building. Now then, God was dealing with men that cannot hear him. You know the story when God wanted to speak to all of them, they said, no, no, no. Only Moses should go and hear and receive for everybody. What God couldn't do with the children of Israel in the wilderness, he's doing with us today. And what is that? Having one-on-one -on -one relationship with us. But if we all now understand as we relate with him, to begin to form the culture of seeing to it that the needs of God's children, they are met because God spoke about it. Not just the needs of God's children, the need of all mankind is met. When we begin to align ourselves to this truth, even in the law Moses gave to them, the tithe catered for the widows, the orphans, the Levites, those who specially do God's work, and then strangers. Everybody is covered in this. Brothers and sisters, go ponder on these truths. God wants to meet the needs of everyone on earth. And the way he has planned to do it is with his money, the tithe. The tithe belongs to God. Please give it to him. Go before him and ask him, let him guide you. Let him guide you. And as you obey him, and you begin to find community of believers who do this, who practice this, then begin to pray together and see how God is going to use us to form a culture. And you see what culture does? Culture makes a statement. So people began to begin to realize, oh, this is how these people behave. Look at the early church. They had a culture of seeing to it that every need is met. The first strife that almost entered the church entered because of needs of people. And what was the response of the disciples? They said, choose ye seven men full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, not normal men. The strife we have in the world today is simply because the church is not living to his expectation, God's expectation of the church. They are not. Paul said, if we sow to the flesh, we will of the flesh reap corruption. If we sow to the spirit, we will reap What the church has been doing in Titan is sowing to the flesh. And what are we reaping? Corruption. We find corruption everywhere. Corruption in the world, corruption in the church. Things are getting worse. Who do you hold responsible? The church, not the devil. If the church begins to sow to the spirit, we'll begin to reap life everlasting. But let it begin with you. As you begin to obey God, find other believers that are like-minded, that are participating in this truth, bringing their tithes to God and seeing God use them to bless all the families of the earth. And as we keep practicing this, we'll build God a kingdom. And as God begins to make you a person of influence, think, how do I use this my position? How do I use this my influence to create a system, to create laws that will ensure that everybody's need is being taken care of? That's all that God is concerned about. And let him use us to fulfill the blessing and the promise he made to Abraham. Let him use us. Let him use you. I pray for you today that your eyes will be open to this reality. 
I pray that the Spirit of God, having caused you to hear, hear this message, will take it deeper in your heart and explain in details to you. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Let this year be a year that you'll see the manifested hand of God over your life. You will see God meet your needs like never before. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. God bless you. As I told you earlier, I'm a super judge and you can follow us on social media to catch up um, where we're holding a physical meeting or follow us online for our messages. God bless you. Bye-bye.